Welcome everyone to another of our software design tech talks. This series is hosted by SweetEU, the Google School of Software Engineering. Today, I'm really excited that we have Felina Hermans with us. Felina is a professor of computer science education at the Breyer Univer Universiteit Amsterdam. And I apologize for all the Dutch speakers in the audience for my <laughs> pronunciation. Uh, she is also the creator of the Heady Programming Language, language a gradual and multilingual programming language designed for teaching. And finally, and perhaps most importantly for today's talk, she is the author of the book, The Programmer's Brain, What Everyone Needs to Know About Cognition. So I've read the book, and what really excites me about it is that as software engineers, we tend to develop rough intuitions for what makes code easy or hard to understand. And The Programmer's Brain is really all about the cognitive science, the things we know that are the roots of those uh, rough intuitions. So the idea being that if we can understand those cognitive science ideas, we can make code that's easier to understand and work on. So I'm really excited for today's talk. So with that, I'll hand it over to Felina to present her talk about how your code, or sorry, how your brain processes code. Cool, thanks for the intro, Jonathan. So my name is indeed is Feline Hermans. I'm a professor at Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam, which is really 100 meters from the Google office in Amsterdam, so that's very easy. And indeed, I'm going to talk today about my research into how brains process code. And if I talk about this topic, often people think that I have a background in psychology or cognition, but I'm actually just a humble programmer like you that somehow got sidetracked a little bit from my original work. So to understand really how I came to research how brains understand code, we have to go back a very long time ago to 2013 when I started to teach programming in a high school. I was sort of burned out from my regular work, which was being an academic in a university. And I thought, is this life, is this really fun enough? I don't know what I want to do. You know what? I'm going to teach in high school one day a week because then I'm sure I'm doing something valuable and I think it will be fun also. So I started to teach kids programming and as I had imagined it would be really easy because I thought I know everything about programming and these are 12 year olds so how hard can it be right? What can they ask me what I don't know about programming? This will be very easy. I'm going to teach you. And then what happened not explicitly but subconsciously is that I started to reflect on how I learned programming when I was a kid. So this is me in the 90s behind my dad's really big computer or actually behind the screen because the computer was on the ground, it was so big. And then how did I learn programming when I was a kid? I didn't learn programming from a person because I didn't know anyone that knew programming. None and of my parents or other adults in my life knew any programming. So how did I learn programming? I had a book. This was the book I had, literally this book, Basic Computer Games, that was allegedly going to teach me how to build games. But it didn't really teach me anything. If you would open this book, then I see by the thumbs going up that other people maybe recognize this experience. If you would open it, it wasn't like, this is a for loop and this is an if statement. If you'd open it, it looked like this. This is just printed out basic listings that you magically copied into the computer. And as you can probably hear, English is not my first language. When I was reading all this, I didn't know any English, but this has next and exit and velocity in it. I had no clue just copying this in the computer because the front cover of this book promised me games. And well, there was no internet or Steam. I didn't have an Xbox. It was not invented yet. So what was I going to do if I wanted to have a game? This was apparently the only way to get a game. And this is not just my experience. A lot of people my age that are now in their 40s, the children of the 80s that are now programmers actually learned programming this way. And because of this, maybe we have just acquired a little bit of mental damage, right? We think this is a normal way of learning and we think that compilers are great teachers. We think that just because the compiler was the only teacher that we had, that this is a very, very good way to learn, having a compiler shout at you unmatched semicolon or something like this, or syntax error without any explanation. This was certainly what I was thinking, again, not explicitly, but implicitly, when I started to teach in this high school. I thought, well, I just give the kids some booklets. Well, it's not basic, it's other programming languages these days, but I just give them these printed out codes, they copy this into the computer, and then they get a game, and then they're happy, and they go out to be programmers later in life. 
Of course, it wasn't basic, but it was Python. And probably many of you are familiar with Python. So I said to the kids, we are going to do programming. Kids, look, this is Python. And the kids like, oh, this is nice. If we do this code, then do we have Minecraft? <laughs> no, I don't even know how to build Minecraft. We're going to make a text adventure in three months or something. So already I figured out like, hmm, there's an interesting difference between the things I thought were very cool when I was 12 and the types of things kids are used to now, right? The games that you can make are a lot more cool. So that was the first hurdle. But the second hurdle was actually syntax, right? If you look at this code, not for us experts, but for beginners, there's really a lot of things you can mess up in this code snippet, right? This really works, but what about this? If you accidentally put an uppercase P there, right? This is such a reasonable mistake because we've drilled children that sentences start with an uppercase letter. So this is so reasonable. And do you think the computer can deal with this? No, it says name error, name print is not defined. Like, what do you mean print is not defined? You know, I was printing two minutes ago. Why is this not working? And then especially now with GPT, like with algorithms being so powerful, how can you explain to a kid that if you say, what is the capital of Venezuela? The computer can easily fix this. What is 17 times 341? He can do it, but he cannot distinguish between an uppercase and a lowercase p. This doesn't really fit, right? That is just madness. Here's another one. Oops, they forgot the closing bracket. It is so clear what's going on here. It doesn't need any explanation for any human, but what does Python say? Syntax error, unexpected EOF while parsing. <laughs> teacher, teacher, what is parsing? <laughs> I don't wanna talk about parsing, right? I wanna talk about parsing all the time, but not in the first programming lesson. Here's another one. Teacher, I have learned from my previous mistakes. Everything is there. The quotes are there, the brackets are there, there are no uppercase letters in the commands, this is working. But it isn't. <laughs> this is Python. There's an invisible mistake there, right? Oh no, this isn't working. Indentation error, unexpected indent. This is so unreasonably hard. And I saw the kids just getting sadder and more frustrated and less excited about programming basically every week. And then I thought, hmm. Why is this hard, right? These are 12 year olds, they go to school, they can do math, they can do reading. It's not that their brains aren't working, like their brains seem to be fine, but I cannot get any programming in their brains. Why? Why is it hard to learn programming? And then I was sort of at a crossroad because in the meantime, as I said, I was a scientist. I was supposed to do research in the software engineering field, working on IDE tools, actually. That was what I was supposed to do. But in the meantime, I was not so interested in that anymore. What I was getting interested in is figuring out how do kids learn programming? Or, or more generally even, how do people learn anything? So it was this crossroad where it's like, hmm, should I do my actual real job? Oh, but I don't want to. I am actually more interested in this question of how do people learn? And of course, it wasn't really like this. It just went slowly. And over time, I figured I was so much more intrigued by this question, how people learn anything than my actual job, which is now fun because now I have a good job. But then I was almost fired for not doing my job. So <laughs> in retrospect, it is fun. But I was also reflecting on how weird is it that in the field of programming and computer science, whether that is in traditional university education or through a boot camp, no one teaches you anything about learning. We all tell each other, oh, but if you're a programmer, you will continuously learn in your whole career because there will be new frameworks and there will be new programming languages. So it's really important you know how to learn. But never is there a course on learning. Never is there a book on learning. How do we learn anything? We don't really know, at least I didn't know, and no computer science education that I had followed, a bachelor, a master, and a PhD, there was nowhere anything about learning. And therefore also this trope that we all grew up with, with, oh, you know, you just learn by doing, that is the only frame of reference that we have, that by copying code and by doing it a lot, really every day I still see this on LinkedIn, oh, you want to learn how to programming? Just pick a project and get started. We, we really think that's the way of learning. 
But I got really interested in what actually happens. And the, we don't really know exactly what happens in your brain if you process code. There hasn't been so much research into this, but there's been massive amounts of research into how people pro process anything else, like text and letters and math. So by reading a lot of research on how brains process basically anything, you can do a lot of educated guesses and learn a lot about what actually happens when you read source code. So this is part two sort of of this talk. Let's do a basic introduction into cognitive science from the perspective of programming. These were all things that I didn't really know before I started to dive into this, or I had heard some terms, but I didn't really know the details. So what happens in your brain? If information comes into your brain through your eyes or ears or other senses, firstly, it is stored in the short-term memory. And we have already known about the short-term memory for a really long time. In the 1950s, there was a researcher called George Miller, and he had already figured out that the short-term memory is tiny, that it is between five and nine elements. And you might be aware of this because it's a really famous psychology paper and the title is the magic number seven plus or minus two. So in between five and nine, things can only fit in your short-term memory. It is really very, very small. This we've known for almost a hundred years. And then you think, well, but how, how do things work if you can only remember five to nine things? How can we process like large amounts of code, right? Let's do an experiment, a little bit of mandatory audience participation. Where I am, it is the end of the day, so people are tired. So I have to keep you energized a little bit. We're gonna do a puzzle. So the puzzle is this. On the screen, I will show you a brief sentence. This is a three word sentence. So that should be doable even at 4 p.m. in the evening. I will show you the sentence and your only goal is to remember the sentence. That's the goal. There's no prize. The prize is you're exercising your brain. Here we go. Are you ready? I hope also online you are ready. Don't blink because you'll miss it. It is a very briefly shown sentence. Here we go. So any takers, you can put it in the chat. You can read it aloud if you're in the room with me. What was on the screen? Symbols. Okay, well, you got something, right? So some information through your senses was in your short-term memory, but you couldn't really process anything, right? <clears throat> but I guess you see that there's a little bit of a trick to this. We will do another sentence, just to, like lower the threshold a little bit to meet you where you are. Same exercise. I will show another sentence briefly. <laughs> Zero slash three is all I saw is what Ryan is saying. Another sentence. Here we go. The exercise is the same. I'll show you the sentence briefly. You remember the sentence. Ready? Here we go. Oh, sorry. Ha! A little bit of theory in between. So the short-term memory, when it is doing something, it is actually collaborating with the working memory. So the short-term memory sends the information into the working memory, and the working memory, in turn, collaborates with the long-term memory. So it's like, hey, long-term memory, I have some information here. Do you know anything about this information? And then now your long-term memory was saying, <laughs> no, I got nothing, right? I have no clue what this is. So information from the long-term memory is supporting your working memory. So now we'll do the other sentence. Here we go. That was the sentence. This was easier, right? It was easier to remember because at least your brain didn't say symbols, but probably it said, Letters, right? But this is this is already an advancement. And maybe you ev could even remember some letters. And maybe if you looked at it long enough, <laughs> someone almost has the letters correctly. Well done. That the first one is A and the second one is B. So sometimes people say, oh, it was A, B, C. Because there are long-term memory things. Oh, I see an A, I see a B. Probably the next one is a C. So we'll do one more of the puzzles. Same puzzle, three word sentence, and you have to remember the sentence. Are you ready? Here we go. So you see how easy it is, right? This is not a trick. I mean, it is a trick, of course, but it is very much possible to remember a three word sentence if it's only shown to you for like a snap second. Why? 
because of your long-term memory. Your long-term memory is not remembering, oh, this is half a circle and a circle with a comma attached and a big Catholic cross, as you see on the church, is not remembering symbols. It's not remembering letters. Immediately, you can translate cat into a cat, and you can translate loves into something and cake. And this is easily three concepts below this limit of five to nine elements in your short-term memory. So you can easily remember this and you can even also think about it you think oh cake mm, cake i am hungry or oh my cat i miss my cat if i go to the office if i come back i'll give her a little snack right you can think these things while also remembering these three words not because this sentence is inherently harder or easier than the first sentence i showed you it is the same the only thing that's different between the first sentence and the second sentence is the knowledge you already have and I think for me, this is one of the most eye-opening things that I realized. And this is something for me that translates immediately to programming and to working in a team of software engineers. Because I have definitely onboarded juniors into my team saying, da 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 da, cat, here's a cat and there's cake and the cat loves cake. Is it clear to you, right? Because for me, all these concepts were so clear. This is the class, this is the interface, this is the stuff that's in the code base, all the words, all the vocabulary, both the domain vocabulary and the technical vocabulary for me was cat loves cake. And and then two weeks later, this junior comes back and he has remembered nothing. I'm like, kids these days, they don't know anything. <laughs> Who is delivering these kids from the university with a degree? Oh, <laughs> that would be me. <laughs> Oops. But I, this is the difference. If you don't really have a solid knowledge of all the things, you cannot remember anything, right? So it's not that you were a lot less smart five minutes ago, but you couldn't remember it just because you were lacking the right context. And then sometimes it's really, really hard to see, still for me, even knowing this, it's hard to see the difference be between someone that is really smart, but that's just lacking technical vocabulary or domain vocabulary, and someone that just needs help in understanding things and they don't miss the vocabulary, this is really still hard to see because the behavior is the same. The behavior is I explain something to you and you remember nothing and I explain it again and you still don't remember it, right? But then think of how many tries would you need to remember that first sentence? Maybe 10, maybe 20. It would take you a lot of time really to learn that because there's no other information that you can connect this to. So these concepts also called trunks are the elements that are removed from the long-term memory. So you get some information and your long-term memory says, oh, I group this into chunks, and that is what you use in processing information. So now we have a little bit of theory. Let's look at some actual source code. Let's look at three programs and see how these three different memory elements, long-term memory, working memory, and short-term memory, look differently in terms of confusion. Here's an APL program. Anyone know APL or has seen APL? Usually if it's people in the room, they're like, yeah, I took your course and that's how they know APL. So it's a very theoretical language from the 1960s that's based on vector calculus. So if I ask you in the chat or in the room, what does this program do? Any clues in the chats? There are no clues in the room here. This is not an understandability program right, problem, right? The only problem is here, you lack knowledge. You just print a vector of two. That is wrong. Nice try, Maxime. It's not that. I will reveal it a bit later. So this is not a situation in which you say, I don't understand, right? There, there's nothing to understand. This is more the situation where you say, I don't know. And this is, again, something that has enriched my vocabulary. The difference between I don't know and I don't understand. Sometimes if some programmer in my team is teaching me a new API that I've never seen, I'm still prone to say, oh, this looks complicated. I don't understand. But I'm really trying to train myself and also train people in my team to make this distinction themselves. Now I'm now trying to say, oh, I don't know this yet which is really a different problem from I don't understand, because clearly you would be capable of understanding this. What it actually does is it transforms the number N into binary representation, because <laughs> it's APL, friends, because this is sort of a mapping of mapping this vector on this, then also turned into a vector, and then it makes 
a binary representation out of it. You are capable of understanding that something can work like this. And now you, that you know it, you can sort of understand it insofar as it's possible to understand APL. This is just what that thing, that T, it's not a T actually, it's a top uh, um, function. That is what it does. Now you know, right? Now you understand and know. So the issue here was really a long-term memory issue. You just didn't know the thing, now you know the thing, you immediately understand the problem. Here is a very different form of confusion. So this is Python, I think most people see this, and what you see here is a list comprehension, which is a very, I see someone frowning in the audience, this is great. This is a very Pythonic way of doing something, a very Python way, because this creates a list by iterating over the elements in another list, taking the first name from that either each um, element in the list and then filtering if the age is uh, over 50. So if you have seen this before, if you are a Python programmer like I am, then this takes you no energy. It's like immediately you can see what's going on. But if you come from a different background, maybe C Sharp or Java, then you're like, yeah, I sort of recognize some of the things, right? I know what a for is, I know what an if is. This is not necessarily a long-term memory issue, but it's, oh, there's many things are going on. Customer names, first name, for C in customers, if C, H, bigger than 50. There's so many elements that if you've not been exposed to this um, sort of phrasing of uh, creating a list, they're like, ah, oh, what exactly is going on? I don't know precisely. And this is a short-term memory issue. And, but here you see the interaction between long-term memory and short-term memory. For some of you that are Python programmers, this is no issue at all. For some of you, it's like, oh, I've never seen this before. I know the individual elements, but how it clicks together, it takes me somewhat more work. So that is a short-term memory issue. Here's yet another different type of confusion. This is a basic program. I'm going to guess that most of you see the basic building blocks here, right? Assigning a variable, a loop, a loop iterator for n in n to zero. So all the ingredients are familiar. So it's not really a long-term issue. But then you're like, yes, I see the individual lines of code, but what does this do exactly? Not really a long-term memory problem, not really a short-term memory problem, but what's happening here is a working memory problem. That if you want to do this, then you're almost taking out your finger, right? You have to take your finger to the screen and say, okay, <laughs> what is going on here? And re read like a five-year-old line by line, but even reading line by line, there's a lot of magic behind these lines of code that's not visible from this view. You maybe want to step through the program saying, okay, I have no clue, let's execute it with a value of seven, for example, right? Let's, let's put seven on N and then see, okay, well, if N is seven, then this is three. Okay, so this becomes a string. One, okay, let's do one more step. In order to really understand this, you have to do something that we call cognitive compiling, which is basically compiling with your brain or compiling with the actual compiler, trying out values. If you find something like this undocumented somewhere, just trying out some stuff, using the debugger to step through, putting print statements everywhere. So this is a working memory problem. There's just not enough processing power in your brain, independently of prior knowledge, to really figure out what's going on here. So here it is very fair to say, I don't understand this. And there's not an easy magic fix like we had with APL that says, okay, if I would just give you this information, then you would know it, right? There's not this little block of information. I can tell you that this too makes a binary representation from number N, but then still you don't really understand it. So you, then you understand what it does, but really figuring out like, why is this happening? That just takes processing power. And that's a working memory issue. So these different types of confusion, as I said, for me, this has really enriched my vocabulary for myself and for others in my team, trying to make the difference between, are you not understanding or do you not know? And is this understanding based on a confusion that I can easily take away? Like I can explain to you what a list comprehension is and then you're like, now I see, or does the understanding of this very complicated code require a view that's not really in the source code? a drawing or an architecture diagram or documentation because the code in itself is doing magic that you cannot really easily extract from the code. And these different forms of confusion also have different solutions. 
right? In addition to this different vocabulary that I like to use for these different situations, there are also different solutions. If you have a problem like this, where you're simply lacking information, then the solution is, I give you information. And if you want to learn a programming language, like assume you want to learn APL, then the best way that you can do this is really just to practice some syntax to make something called flashcards. It's very useful where on, this is, comes from natural language education, where on one side you put French and then on the other side you put Dutch and then you pick up the cards and you can see, oh, do I know this word or something that's also in Duolingo where you have to match different words together. That way of building up a vocabulary is very uncommon in programming because we think, oh, you know, you just learn from trying out stuff. But it actually works really well. If you want to learn APL, then you put some symbols on one side of the card and on the other side, you put the name or the meaning of the symbol. This T thingy is called encode. This is how you practice. And you can do this for, if you, for example, know Python, but you want to learn Java, you can also put four statements on one side and practice the syntax. And this really, I think, goes contrary to what many people in our community believe, that, oh, you don't need to know syntax because you can just look it up, right? Look it up on Google or use GitHub Copilot. Why, why would you learn anything? Well, this, what I was just talking about, is the reason why you want to learn stuff. If it's not solidified in your long-term memory, then you look at some code snippet that you get from Google or Stack Overflow or from an AI system, and you cannot easily process all the individual ingredients. You will only be able to quickly understand and assess source code from your coworker or from an AI if you know the basic building blocks. And this is really an easy way to learn, and this is a lot more effective. Research has extensively shown this across different areas. It's a lot more effective to just practice some basic building blocks and to immediately dive in and be exposed to building blocks with sort of a half-assed brittle knowledge of stuff. If you have this situation where you have codes in which you understand all the ingredients, but it's just phrased in a way that doesn't fit your prior knowledge. Again, if you're not a Python programmer, but coming from a different background. What you can do is you can actually rewrite code so that it looks more like something that fits your prior knowledge. If you're, if you're a hardcore Java programmer and you've never seen Python, this second solution is actually going to be more readable for you because it looks more, it has the shape of code that you've seen more often before. And in a sense, it is more explicit, right? It says, this is a list I'm creating and I'm iterating over this other list. And this is the operation I'm performing. So this, I call this in my book, a cognitive refactoring. So this is not a refactoring in order to improve the source code. This is a refactoring in order to take the source code and bring it closer to my prior knowledge. And this sometimes angers people because they say, no, this is not a refactoring. You're making it worse, right? Look at the elegance of the first line and now it is longer. But there isn't really a better or worse. I think the more I think about this, the more I'm coming to the conclusion that there cannot be something like clean code or a coding style, because what is good code for you really depends on your prior knowledge. So there are a lot of people for which this second version, even if it's longer and more contrived, is just closer to their prior knowledge. And of course, the other way around might also be true. Uh, maybe you're a Haskell programmer and then you're exposed to this second version. Like, hey, this is weird, right? I, I don't want to do explicit looping. I want to directly create a list. So it really depends, I think, on your prior knowledge, which one is better. But taking codes and putting it into a shape that is easier to process is really something that is valuable. And you don't have to, of course, commit this into source control. You can just do this for your own understanding. And there are lots of other examples in my book of cognitive refactorings. Another form, I think, of cognitive refactoring is inlining function calls. Because it's really nice, right, if you have code that's very well organized and this function does this and this function does that. But if I'm understanding it and I have to jump all the time, oh, now it's calling this function, oh, now it's calling this function. If you inline everything from the perspective of understandability, then it's like, oh, I have everything in one line and I can re sort of read it like a book. That too, that most IDEs can do automatically for you, is not something I think you should be afraid of. Oh no, I'm destroying the abstractions. 
I don't know, you're, you're massaging the code so that you understand it. Much as sometimes if I have to speak English, which I don't really do very well or <laughs> very enthusiastically, I prefer speaking Dutch. Sometimes I write something in Dutch that I have to write. First, I write it in Dutch and then I translate it. Both these exercises are easier for me. Writing Dutch is easier. And then I've done the heavy thinking and then the translation is also easy. This is how you do this with code as well. You translate it into a former like, ha, now I understand it. I make some changes and then I bring it back. So a more familiar form, whatever of these two for you is more familiar, means that you will use less chunks in your long-term memory. And this is one of the examples. My book has plenty of them of a cognitive refactoring. And then finally, this final solution, if you or the final problem, if you have code where you're like, <laughs> I have no clue what this is doing. My working memory is just getting too full. Then it's good to realize again, the work of George Miller that still sort of holds true today. There are only limited resources in your working memory. And it's a little bit the gene lottery. Some people have a little bit of a higher limit in their working memory, but this, is, this bandwidth is really very small. So if you're reading code and you feel like, ah, I cannot grasp this, this is the limit of your working memory, wherever your exact limit is. And then the best thing you can do is offload some of the processing that you're doing outside of your brain, because you cannot currently, maybe in the future Elon Musk will do it, but for now we cannot expand our brains. But we can expand our brains with papers or, or whiteboard, right? Something else. So for example, this is just one of the examples. Again, my book has many other examples that you can support your working memory. You can say, okay, there are some variables in this code. I have no clue what the variables are doing, but I'm just gonna step through the code and I'm trying to see an understanding of what's happening. Okay, step one. I put seven in N, what happens? Okay, uh, B string is empty string. And then you step through the code. Okay, iteration one, these are the values. Iteration two, these are the values. What is the connection between this value and the other value? Or if you're working with an API that you've never seen, right? Just writing down, oh, here's an API call. These are the parameters. Okay, here I'm also calling the API. These are the parameters, trying to gain an understanding. These are typical situations in which you cannot hold all that many in your brain at the same time. Understanding your own limits and thinking, ha, my brain is full. Now I'm going to deliberately put this in paper in a structured way. Also for me has really enriched my sort of problem solving skills because I was often in a situation where I got code, maybe in a code review. It's like, I don't understand this. And then I asked the person that wrote it, what does it do? And then for example, with this, they say, yeah, it calculates the binary form of the numbers. Like, yes, yes, I can read the, I can read what you wrote in the pull request, but it doesn't make me understand why it is working the way it is, right? So then in very situations, I was debugging, but not effectively. I'll put a breakpoint there. I'll step through the codes by, by magic and sheer willpower. At one point, I will understand this, but I wasn't deliberate about it. And then it was also not so very effective. Whereas now I'm a lot more effective. And there's, as I said in the book, other strategies as well that you can use to support your working memory. Step one is understanding, oh, this is too much. And then step two is choosing a formalism, whatever that is, in which you can dump some information outside of your brain so you can free up space to do actual thinking. So back to my life story. This is like, I, I say this often, this the, giving these talks is like therapy, but free. So that's good. <laughs> I don't have to pay someone to listen to my troubles. I can just talk about it and you're forced to stay. So I was at this point in life where I'm like, yes, yes. I, I figured out how people learn. This is really interesting. I didn't do anything for two years. I was only reading books about cognitive science, but now I know many things. I thought, oh, you know, I want to write a book about this because I think there are so many people that are programmers like me never learned anything about this. So I'll put all of this in writing and make a book so many people know all these different limits and how they can interact with source code in a better way. So I sort of got distracted on point one, like figure out how people learn. This is really interesting. And that was fun and I learned a lot. But then I sort of exited the rabbit hole again. I thought, why was I doing all these things? I got somewhat distracted. I was doing all these things because I wanted to teach kids programming better. That was my actual goal, right? My goal wasn't necessarily to teach professional programmers how to do their job in a more effective way. My goal was to teach kids programming better. So my whole book, in a sense for me, was a derivation of the actual question 
now that I know how people learn, I can actually apply this in my programming class to teach code better. And that is, Jonas already mentioned it, that is what became the Hedy programming language, which is free and open source. And if I say, in, in, if I was saying in the talk, when I'm onboarding people or working with my team, the team I mean is the big open source project that I'm now accidentally running called Hedy. So many of the ideas in the book are actually coming back into the programming language. And the most prominent idea, I think, of the programming language is that all these brackets and quotes and all these extra things that we put in programming languages make your brain very full. And if you're a beginner, having to focus on brackets and also quotes creates a very full working memory. And that's fine if you're an expert because you've seen all these syntactic concepts. But if you're a beginner, you have to remember all of the syntax, but you don't really have an understanding. And it's also not really necessary. So here you see Hedy. This is the first level of Hedy, where you can just say print high. Right? You don't need brackets. You don't need quotes. People that like me have done basic. See that it looks a little bit like when we were learning basic. So you don't have any syntax, and that just works. So you can just have something here, and then it prints. And one other thing I was mentioning in the beginning is that kids said, yeah, you know, why are we doing this? We're just making something that is boring. Just This is just text. We want to make something more interesting. If I just want to print Hello World, I can open Word and put Hello World there. So from the beginning, we also have this user interaction built in, where you have a command ask, which is like inputs. It says, hey, how are you? And then you can put in something like, uh, I'm fine or I'm great. And then it repeats this answer back. So from the beginning, we print this idea on kids, look, you're creating something for someone to use. This is not just randomly outputting text. And then as I said, we try to not overload the working memory. So every level that we have, we have 18 levels, we add a little bit of a concept and a little bit of syntax with it. So this is level two in which we introduce variables. And this is code that does something. So it defines name is Feline and it prints hello name. And this actually works. And then people in the audience sometimes are like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> what is happening? How is this working? Because name is a variable, but hello is a string. <laughs> right? This is really hard. For us, that programmers, we're like, no, but how does the computer know the difference between a variable and a string value? But for a kid, this is not so important yet, right? I can easily do two rounds of parsing and then figure out, oh, this is a variable name. And if it's a variable name, I just pick the definition. Technically, this is very easy, but there aren't any programming languages that, that do this. Because this is really designed from the perspective of how do I explain a variable to you with the least amount of syntax? How do I explain the concept of a variable without putting in your brain all these elements in your working memory that aren't really necessary? And here, if you want to do this in Python, just for comparison, this is what you ha would have to do in Python if you want to do something similar. You have to say print with brackets. And you have to say, this is a string. Don't forget the comma. Put the variable there. Put the value also between quotes. And then when I was trying to trying and failing to teach this to kids, some kids would really never grasp the idea of a variable because they were just fighting with the syntax all of the time and their brains were only focused on, oh, a quote here, oh, a bracket there. I couldn't get their brains to focus on the idea of, hey, a variable, this is storing something in the computer. You don't need to need, know more now. We will teach you more later. So this is level four. In level four, we introduce the quotation marks because at one point you have to learn, well, computers are not so very smart. They cannot always distinguish between variable names and values. So here we put the quotes there. But if you forget one, then we have, I think, quite reasonable error messages. We say, hey, be careful. If you ask or print something, it should start and finish with a quote. You forgot that for the text. How are you? So it clearly explains what the issue is. And this is also enabled by the small size of the language. We only have like six keywords in level two. So the smaller your language, the easier it is for a compiler to precisely pinpoint what production is happening and then have error productions with many common errors. 
And as I said, we have 18 different levels. So this is level 18, which if you are a Python programmer, you can see this is more or less Python. So slowly in all of the steps, we get closer and closer to the syntax of Python until we're at level 18. And then we say to kids, ha ha, well, actually you were learning Python, which we really see as something like trainer wheels on a bike. Like you want to have an adult bike if you're a kid, you don't want to have this baby bike, baby trike with three wheels. You want to have a real bike, but this is too hard. So we put the trainer wheels on the bike. But then at one point you can bike and you put the training wheels off and then it's like, ha, huh, now you have a real bike. Now you have an actual programming language. So this actually works. So this I think is for me even more the result of this whole exploration into how do people learn something when I figured that out, to me, it was so clear that programming languages, as we have them now, were never really designed to minimize the working memory workload. No one ever thought of, oh, let's make a language that doesn't overload your working memory, partly because many of us that are designing programming languages have learned in the way that I also learned just because I had no other hobbies and there was no internet. So there was nothing else to do. There was no tic -tac, TikTok distraction or anything. But then if you take this cognitive design into your programming language design, you can create things that are a lot easier to process. And I think a lot of the interventions that I've done in Haiti at the programming language level can also very much be applied at the code base level, thinking of what is really the stuff that we need? Do we really need all the bells and whistles here? What's, what function calls in our API? What parameters can we remove? Like, can we make a simple version that many people use and then you don't have to put parameters? Stuff like this. What functions do we really need? Can we make stuff simpler and smaller so that it's easier for people to grok? And one thing that's not really, really related to the cognitive design of the programming language itself, but just something I'm really proud of. So I'm here to show off my work, so I'll show this off as well. What you see here is Hattie in English. But I teach in the Netherlands and my kids don't want to program in English, they want to program in Dutch. And initially I thought, yeah, you know, why, why would I do this? I learned in English, it is not so hard. But kids were really adamant, the kids I was teaching, it's like, why don't you make it in Dutch? I said, why, why should I do this? The kids said, well, why shouldn't you do it? You are the maker of this. Why don't you make it in Dutch? I thought, yeah, 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 okay. Well, seems like a lot of work, but uh, I did it. And this is actually when, when Hattie really blew up, when it became from something I built for my class into this big international project that is entirely out of control. Because once we added Dutch, then people started to add other languages like French, German, this is Spanish. And the farther away we got from Dutch, which is basically English, I thought, yes, well, if your language is imprimeer for printing, then print is a little bit harder. So yeah, yes, I see more value into it. And then after Spanish, we also went to other non-Western languages like Hindi and Bengali and Chinese were added. And then I thought, yes, the farther your language is from English, the more useful it is to actually do this in your own language. And today we support 49 different languages, Latin languages and non-Latin languages, and also right to left languages like Arabic, which I'm most proud of because this was six months of my life, making the whole interface right to left and the parser. And there's lots of other videos of me you can find that actually explain how the technicalities of this actually work. And, uh, I see people being excited about it, that's really cool. So this was also for me such a journey into what I think is easy and what I think is necessary is so much shaped by my perspective, being you know, from a middle-class family that gave me a computer in the 90s to being from a Western language with an alphabet and a keyboard that can type all the letters. The, so for me, it's also such a journey into Basically, other people exist with different prior knowledges, and how does that factor into programming language design, into source code design? So yeah, this is Hedy again, it is open source. So if you are looking for a nice project to contribute to, or if there's one of the languages that you speak that we don't support yet, we're always very welcome to get participants. The end, this is me, I am on Twitter, but you know, Twitter. So <laughs> this is my Twitter handle and my website if you wanna follow me in my newsletter. 
if you want to read the book or order the book, if you're not close to Jonathan physically, otherwise I'm sure he will give you his copy. You can go to felina.com slash book to order it as an ebook or as a paper book. And if you want to know more about Hedy, you can go to felina.com slash Hedy for the GitHub. Again, Hedy is super free. So if you have kids in that age group, totally check it out. It is free and open source and we're always looking for people to help out. And with that, I think we have some time for questions. Thank you very much, Athelina. This was really good. Uh, let's see, let me bring up the Q&A. Um, so first question is, if different forms of code are better, cleaner, simpler, or different readers, as you discussed in the context of cognitive refactoring, what does that mean for the goal of increasing the readability of a code base across a community of developers? This is such a good question. Like this is another one hour talk, but I'll try to be brief. So basically I think what that means, at least what it means for me is there cannot be one way of doing things. So ideally, and I have coined this idea, I hope someone takes this idea and runs with it. I would like my IDE to know my prior understanding. And I think specifically now with all the great AI tools, it shouldn't be so hard to say, oh, here is what I know, and now massage this code with only using concepts that I already know. Like, this is the concepts I know, and you can do some rewriting to move the code. And this is just a view, right? I will look at the code in my way, and then someone else can look at the code in their way. I don't think this is actually something that would be impossible. But that's, as far as I know, doesn't exist. So what it means now is that maybe there isn't a technical solution for this, that the best solution I can offer for this is empathy and understanding, right? And talking with each other and doing pair programming or ensemble programming with a bigger group where you can figure out, oh, oh, but you just don't know this one thing. Let me explain this to you. Because sometimes, like with the APL example, a little bit of information makes it click for someone. So really spending a lot of time on fussing over, oh, but I like it if it's this way. I get these reviews on my code review and I get this is true for all of you as well. Yeah, but why do you do it this way? I prefer it that way. Yes, but it doesn't really matter because then there will be a third person that we will onboard later that likes it in a third way, right? So it is just so much depending on prior knowledge that spending too much time on deciding how to do stuff isn't even necessarily also useful. Thanks. Let's see, uh, move on. Next question is, what is your take on Hetty versus Scratch? What features from Scratch would you like to import into Hetty? Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, so the benefit of Scratch, for people that don't know Scratch, it's this visual block-based language from MIT, is that you very easily create something that's really impressive. So with a few blocks, you can create like a dancing cat that makes music, or with a few more blocks, you can make like a breakout game or a little uh, action adventure. So what it does really well is tell kids, look, this is where we're going, right? Look all the cool stuff you can build with just a little bit of programming. So this tension, which I think is a tension in many things of learning between this is where we're going and this is the hard work you have to do before. Uh, imagine also learning a natural language, learning French or something, then a teacher might say, well, if you know French, then you can listen to this opera or you can have a conversation in French or you can order dinner. So there's this dot on the horizon, but they will also say, but to, in order to get there, you have to memorize these thousand words, which is going to be super annoying. And Scratch is very much on this, look what is possible side, but it doesn't really help you to learn because it doesn't tell you, okay, now I want to do something a little bit more. Where do I learn this? And Hattie is in a certain sense all the way on the other side, where we are really good at teaching you the basics. Like here are some steps you need to take to build something, but we are not that great at, expressing to kids but this is what you can build after that so that that tension uh, which is not necessarily one feature but more a way of thinking is what we are trying to navigate we have added some features where you can create a little ui you can make music with playing notes so we have some of that but look it's actually really fun but the tension between making it fun and explaining to them that the fun will necessarily require hard work. That is really where a very interesting design space is laying. Let's see, next question. You talked about the role of each part of the brain in learning, short-term, working, long-term. What does the learning process look like when information coming from these different parts are not consistent or contradict each other? 
Yeah, there's a whole chapter about this in my book, so you should definitely read it entirely. Uh, but the, the principle that you're referring to here is called a misconception. So a misconception happens when you think you know something, but you're actually wrong. And sometimes this happens if you go from one programming language to another programming language. And it might be very obvious things like, well, if you go from Python to Java, you have to add types. You will quickly figure out that your assumption that types are not necessary is no longer true in, in the Java world. But then there's smaller things like checked exceptions in Java. If you're coming from a language with exceptions, then you think, I had this when I was coming from C Sharp to Java. I thought, oh, exceptions. I know exceptions. And then there's weird stuff that I've never even seen before. So I'm coming from this assumption that something will work. And then it is slightly different or almost the same, ex except in this one case. So that is a harder learning process because, in a certain sense, you have to unlearn things and you have to be really aware of what the differences are. But there are two techniques. And again, these are explained in the book a little bit more that are called hugging, like hugging each other and bridging. Those are two techniques you can use if you're coming from prior knowledge that is slightly different into new prior knowledge that you can explicitly use. Uh, basically, one is making the domains closer and the other one is explicitly reflecting on the differences that can help you if you come into something with incomplete knowledge. Uh Plus one to that, the misconceptions chapter was uh, one of my favorite chapters of the book. So Thank that was you. really helpful. Uh, she does not pay me to say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it sounds like uh, a bit commercial, but it's not, I promise. Yeah. Uh, let's see, next up, this is sort of related to a previous question. Uh, developers find code simpler based on what's in their prior knowledge. What changes to the undergrad CS curriculum would you make to increase familiarity with concepts that developers could use productively, but are currently inaccessible because they're unfamiliar? Oh, again, this is a great question. Like, what, what would I change to undergrad CS curriculums? Well, I, everything, I think. So one thing that we just don't really do is really road memorization. And I think this will be a struggle that probably I will fight until I, I retire in a few decades, because just practicing more basic concepts in many languages is the way to go. And it's so frustrating because there's research from the 1990s, from 96, where they did a study with, with teenagers, 16, 17 year olds. One group didn't do any programming on the computer for an entire semester. The only thing they, was do, they were doing was reading code and reading explanation. And then the other group was doing a traditional coursework where they were doing programming exercises each week. And then they performed equally on the exam. And this is 96, I don't know how many years ago, this is 30 years ago. And still all undergrad programs are having students submit code from the first week, all building their own auto grader so that we can generate code. Why, why do we still assume that typing code is a way to go? We can be so much more effective and you can have so much more time on task if you quickly talk about concepts. And Haiti is one way of doing that, where we remove syntax, so that's not in the way. But working on paper or just reading code without doing programming exercises is a way to be a lot more effective so that you're just more familiar to so many things. And somehow, I think, you know, you should also always see issues as opportunities. I think GPT, the, the pro, chat GPT and others, make it so that now people are rethinking their curriculum makers are like well all the programming exercise like reverse this string and find the longest alphabetic substring in this blob of text well gpt can do this so now we have to change our exercises because suddenly this thing that we all like despite science showing the opposite is true is no longer really good so that is i think my biggest hope that now we think hey for other reasons, we are in agreement that programming exercises on the computer in actual source code aren't really good exercises. <laughs> yes, oh, Constantine is saying my paper, my teacher used paper and it was so boring. That is again, you know, this scratch versus heady question. Yes, it is boring, but maybe it was worth it, right? And I try to make this metaphor also with my students of going to the gym because teenagers go to the gym all the time. They understand this this language. They're like. I said, do you enjoy going to the gym, right? You can also go play soccer in a team together and have fun. It's like, no, we want to go to the gym because we want to build muscles. This is more fun than going on soccer. It's like, this is the right attitude. These paper exercises is like doing muscles for your programming brand. I mean, they don't listen to me, but they're teenagers. 
<laughs> Let's see. Uh, next up, we have, do you have age recommendations on when to introduce kids into headlang or programming in general, especially given how much you know about how our memory and brain works? Yes. Uh, so we say Hedy is from about age 10 because you do need some good text that you need to be able to read quite well. Um, but you can do programming a lot easier. It really depends on what, what does programming mean for your kids, right? There's this super cool robot that's very cheap that's called the B-Bot. It looks like a B. And then you can program it by saying, oh, go forward, go forward, go left. So the kids then already get this idea of, oh, computers, well, they're programmed by people and you have some control over them. That isn't learning programming concepts. That's more learning, oh, technology, you know, you can interact with it. It's not only this consumer thing that you watch videos, it's also something you can control and interact with. So at that stage, something is, is interesting, just not for the goal of learning concepts, but for the goal of technology interaction. We know from research that really abstract logical thinking only happens when kids are like 11 or 12. So any programming that you do before the age of 11, 12, the goal is probably not to teach them concepts. The goal should be, if it's in alignment with cognitive science, the goal should be to teach them, oh, look, I can build something. Oh, look, mom, look, dad, I made this program. I made the cat dance and now it's blue. Good, you're, a little, you're my little programmer, right? It's not about concepts. It's about that self-efficacy, which especially, sadly, still in 2024, is important for girls because girls already at the age of six or seven think uh, technology is not for me. Technology is hard. I will never be a programmer. And you know, society does that to our kids, if, whether we like it or not. So that it can be a reason to start earlier, specifically with girls and kids from lower socioeconomic backgrounds that don't do computer work at home so that they get over these stereotypes because the older they get the more solidified those stereotypes become i have 16 year old girls saying yeah i cannot do programming it's like have you ever done it no how do you know you cannot do it it is hard my brother tells me so it's like this is hard uh so we're coming close to the end of the hour but uh Pilina, if you've got time I, i'm happy to stick around and answer more questions if I can do a few more, yeah. If it's not, if I'm not bothering anyone with their time, I'm okay taking a few more. If you're interested in listening, okay, sounds good. Yeah, well, anyone who needs to go on to their previous or their next meeting, please feel free. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we will continue having more software design tech talks uh, throughout the year here. I think we have Titus Winters actually coming back in uh, hopefully about a month or so here, uh, coming back. But thank you all for joining us. Uh, yeah. Anyway, with that, I'll move on to our next question for anyone who wants to stick around. Uh, so next to get from uh, Rodrigo, we have the question, how do you handle the transition to actual Python for languages that are non-Latin? Yeah, there are many answers to this question. One answer is that that is a true answer, but also a sad answer is I say, yeah, this is not my problem, right? I did the work. I am an amateur in a certain sense of programming language design. I'm just a university professor. I'm not even employed as a programmer. So I did it. So maybe other programming languages can also do it. Maybe Python or Java. It's not really hard. It's actually weird to me. You can look it up on my website. I have more research on that. It is so weird to me that programming languages don't handle non-Latin anything. Like I tried the whole top Tayobi 10 index and none of them even handle Arabic numerals. Right? So not even keywords, just Arabic numbers, which would be uh, well, I don't want to say a five minute implementation, but a one day implementation of a few people if they really want to do it. So one answer is, you know, you should do the work. Um, and another sort of related answer is I'm hoping to create a generation of people and we have like hundreds of thousands of users a month. So I hope some of them will stick around to become professional programmers and then say, hey, but why isn't this the case, right? I want to do this on, in my own language for various reasons. So we show it's possible technically, and we create this culture in which at least at our platform it is possible. So hopefully in the longer run, there will be a pickup, but now I don't have another answer then. Yeah, it works for me on my platform. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see. Next up from James Coe, we have the question, the conclusion of Hedy's 18 steps leads to Python. What trade-offs were considered to choose Python over other programming languages? Yeah, the, the real answer is no trade-offs because we were teaching Python in the high school where I, I was teaching, where I'm still teaching. So we're teaching Python, right? So my problem was making teaching Python 
less painful. And we had course materials that were built on Python. And I didn't want to throw the other course materials away. And I was also quite convinced that once I got them through this sort of trough of dissolution of Python syntax, that the rest of my materials were actually quite solid. And that's also still what we do in my school. So the first year we use Hedy, and then the second year they just go to Python because they're now well prepared and they've gained this self-confidence and they learn so many concepts that from there we go to Python. So it wasn't really a trade-off, it was just, well, we do Python. And in a certain sense also Hedy is like an, a proof of concept that sadly, sadly went out of control a little bit, right? So I wasn't, then when I was building the first version, I wasn't interested in building something real. I just wanted to build a prototype that showed it could be done, both in terms of will this actually help children and in terms of, but how do I do this technically? Because some people that have ever built a compiler, they're probably like, oh, you have 18 different sub languages times 50 different natural languages. Hmm, this is hard to navigate that grammar space. This is true. So it was really a prototype of can I build this technically and will kids like it? And then accidentally now it is very big, but you could might as well easily also build Hedy to JavaScript or Hedy to, well, maybe not Hedy to Haskell, but something else that you like could be built, but this is what we build. And when you all build, you are professional software builders, I imagine, you know that if you build something and you have users, then it lives, it outlives you. So this is what we have now, whether I like it or not. Uh, another question from Rodrigo, which strategies can we provide to help pick the next hard thing to learn? Uh, Post-beginner Python, how should the student pick? More advanced data structures or stronger typing or learning how CPUs work in detail or how to con handle concurrency at different scales, et cetera? I would say all these things, but I think what matters really here, and there's it's like yet another talk, or this is actually a, sort of a paper that I'm working on at the moment, is we assume, we people, so I'm pointing to me and people that are like me, I liked programming because I wanted to do programming. And I mean, there was this goal of building a game, but ultimately programming was for me the driver. And I think there's so many people in programming that for them, oh, a type system or how the CPU works, that is interesting. But I think there's so many other people that are currently not employed as programmers that do not think like this. They think, what can I build? I want to have an app on my phone to do this. I want to make this app or I want to make this. And they really re reason reversely. So if you are teaching, if you're mentoring someone, uh, whether that is your own kid or a junior in your company, I think a more interesting question is what do you want to build? And we experts can then say, oh, do you want to make a multiplayer game? Well, then concurrency is useful. Um, do you want to do, I don't know what you would really need to know how the CPU works for in more detail, maybe um, uh, train your own LLM and then you use this cool, uh, this cool GeForce Go do thing where you program right on the machine. That is something that you want to learn if you want to do this. I think there's not so many reasons to learn how a CPU works now, unless this is your specific goal. And maybe the same is true for data structures. What do you want to build? What data structures do you need? My experience in teaching both high schoolers and university level students, teaching them with, oh, this is the whole vocabulary of data structures. This is a list and this is a heap and this is whatever we have, or a red black tree. And then many students are not like, mm, more data types, please, right? What data structures. What they want to do is know what the goal is and work backwards from this. As I said, much in the same way as if you take Spanish or French classes, then your teacher will lure you in saying, well, if you just come for 52 weeks and maybe you can order a baguette, right? The, the, the goal is always driven. Not so many people want to learn French just because they love French words and grammar. That's really a programmer's thing. and. A part, I think, of selection bias that people that think that way are here and all the people that do not think that way haven't made it because then you don't really like programming. Thank you. Uh, let's see, next up a question from Ethan. In your research on cognitive science, did you find that different forms of memory are trainable? Is there any risk associated with simplifying syntax while teaching associated with excessive handholding? <laughs> and holding, no judgments. Um, so can you train forms of memory? So the, the good news is your long-term memory is basically infinite. So you can learn as much as you want. There's not really, it's like not like a hard drive that can get full. And research shows that your working memory is actually quite fixed. 
So there's not so much you can do training your working memory. There's these apps, of course, that say, oh, this trains your working memory. But there's really not so much you can do apart from a, a few very, very specific tasks that really make your working memory better. And is there any risk associated, which I feel sort of second question with simplifying syntax, Yes, I mean, there are risk, different risks uh, associated. Teaching one thing and then telling kids, oh, but actually that's not really how it works. Well, it works slightly different, can create annoyance and can create confusion. However, that is how we teach most things, right? If you look at math in many places, if you teach minus, then you say not uh, three minus five, is minus two, but initially three minus five is zero because you have three cookies on the table and there are five kids and they each get a cookie. How many cookies are left? Zero cookies. So you teach this incomplete and slightly erroneous mental model and then you move on to the next for division as well, right? Like uh, nine divided by two is, is, is you have remainder one. Right? So you say, oh, this is four remainder one. You don't immediately go to floating point numbers. And then you go to fractions, and then you go to floating, floating point numbers. So yes, there is risks, but in programming, we're just not used to this incomplete model because we've always taught with a full adult programming language straight away. But in most other fields, we teach small incomplete versions of the truth that we refine both adding concepts but also changing syntax because for remainder one is in a sense a certain syn a different syntax from four comma something all right uh, i think we have about three or four questions left um a question from pratusha did you have to implement any specific changes between the same level in two different languages did you have to implement additional levels for some languages to the equivalent of level 18 in english what are some of the challenges you faced when expanding to languages other than English? Yes, yeah, so many languages are not English, are not like English in any way. So for example, languages can have split verbs. My language has this. We don't really say print something. We actually say print something out. So then the keyword becomes different. The keyword has to be split around the arguments. In some languages, Turkish, for example, word order is different. So we in English say while, and then the condition, but in Turkish, you would first put the condition and then the word iken, which is while. Uh, some languages don't have a verb for R, like Arabic and Japanese. They don't say name is Feline, they just say name Feline. Uh, some languages have gender, and then they want the keywords to be gendered. Some languages have accents, like in French, repeat is repeat, which has two accents. But now kids are going to not type the accents. Is that a parse error? Do we allow that? I have a whole paper that I present that Splash, which is a programming language conference last October, with 12 different issues that you run into when implementing programming languages in not English. So this answer is very long. There are videos of me on YouTube going in extensive detail specifically about all the issues we had with Arabic. Great, that sounds interesting. Let's see. Uh, next up from Nicholas, how does Hedy gradually introduce concepts? Is this designed for kids to self-teach or to work with a classroom environment? So initially it was very much designed to self-teach and not explicitly because I was just, you know, recreating my own childhood. So initially we only had this programming environment for kids, but then we realized that kids that are learning alone they're, they don't really exist anymore. Most kids, if they are learning at home, they learn with a parent that is a programmer. So that is not really the problem. Like the problem is really scaling this up to a classroom. So now we have all of those classroom interfaces where a teacher can log in, invite the students, can see their progress. Students, oh, sorry, teachers can upload their own lesson plans into our system. Uh, to replace our lesson plan so they can customize it to their their own classroom setting. Uh, and teachers can also, it's like a community, so teachers can also use each other's lesson plans. And then you get little stars if other people use your lesson plan. So the way it is now is very much set up to work in a classroom environment. But those features, again, everything is free. So, so we know that some parents also use this classroom environment. So they log in as a teacher and they invite their child into their class. And then they can also add their own lessons into the framework 
work, which is really nice because then you don't have to have paper sheets laying around. You don't have to say, oh, on the other tab is the explanation. You can put your explanation right in the view of the screen. So it is mostly used for classroom environments, but anyone can use it. Even if you're a parent, by all means, go for it. Uh, I believe this is the last question then. Uh, from Michael, do you feel that there is a trade off between minimizing working memory and learning? Where, if code always minimizes working memory, then it won't ask the reader to learn the shiny new object? Perhaps that's not a bad thing, and we need a bit more status quo bias software. Oh, that's, that's deep. Um, so, one answer is that, um, you, which I didn't talk about now, but it is in the book, that if you are doing something, you always need to have a little bit of working memory left specifically for storing something into long-term memory. So there is not really this risk because you need to make sure that, that the load is minimized enough so that there's also room for remembering. Right? Probably with the cat loves cake, you remember it because you had space left to remember. And the other one, even the letters that you might have remembered then, you don't remember them now. But that being said, if you work in a team, like if I have this magical IDE extension that unrolls all list comprehensions always for me, then I don't learn the list comprehensions because I'm not exposed to them. So there, I think there is a little bit of a trade-off, but the way our field is now, not so many people uh, have really this understanding that this working memory load should be lowered. So for now, I think if we all try to lower everything, we're not quickly at the risk where everyone's going to get super lazy. It's like, ah, oh, yes, I will consume the code in the easiest way possible. I think the problem as an industry we have is more that everything is so complicated and that people love complicated, right? That for various reasons, whether that is if I write complicated code, they cannot fire me. Or if I write complicated code, I feel really smart and good about myself. There are so many reasons that we have now that writing complicated code is valued. Like there are, I still think even being a lover of programming, but there are competitions still code golf, where the goal is to make code as small and contrived as possible. That is wh where our community is at. There are hundreds of ESO length, like ESO theory languages that work with white space. There's a language made for gorillas. It's called OOK, and the keywords are OOK, 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 because it's fun to make stuff ridiculously complicated. I think if we lower that, we will be fine for a while. And if not, call me back in a few years. Sounds good. All right. Well, with that, I think that's the end of our questions. Thank you very much, Melina, for being here. We really appreciate it. This has I don't been exactly a great talk. know where I'm Thank waving. You. Where is the camera even? Yeah, yeah, I pretty much straight ahead of you. Oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me today. It was lots of fun. There were great questions.